evening, all. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is, for the guests, my name is Tom Mengler, president of St. Mary's University, and I welcome you all to the, this semester's community conversation. I want first to thank my colleague, President Emeritus Charlie Cottrell, for organizing and hosting another very interesting like to welcome our two honored guests. First, Rick Casey, one of St. Mary's uh, finest and most distinguished graduates. <laughs> and second, I extend a warm welcome, a St. Mary's welcome to Mayor Ron Nierenberg upon your second visit to St. Mary's this fall, the first visit being our NAFTA conference in late September. Uh, in late September, as part of that conference, Mayor Nirenberg shared his thoughts, indeed his vision, about the importance of NAFTA to San Antonio and this region. We're privileged to welcome you back, Mayor, as we watch you lead our city. I know I'm joined by so many others in San Antonio who see a leader with courage to take bold and necessary steps to improve our city and to advance the common good. I also see a leader who looks for and has the character and integrity to reach across the aisle to find the common ground that is so necessary if we're going to improve our city, our state, and our country, and address the many social and economic issues that face us. Tonight, we look forward, Mayor Nirenberg, to sharing with us your vision for, visit, vision for San Antonio. Tonight, though, is also a somber moment as we reflect and pray over, over the horrible events in Sutherland Springs this past weekend. Too often now, too many times, we read or hear about senseless events, the taking of lives of innocent men and women, of young boys and girls. On Sunday, it was our neighbors who were struck down. For many at St. Mary's, and even more at San, in San Antonio, it was friends who were taken, and for some, even family. And so I invite you to join me as we begin all gatherings at St. Mary's with prayer. Good and loving God, in these troubling, tragic days, we pray for your heavenly light. Bestow on us the wisdom and compassion, a charity of heart. Help us to come together to find the common ground that will enable us, to, people of God, to minimize, if not end, senseless violent acts like those this past weekend in Sutherland Springs. And we ask and pray for your blessings, your grace on these victims, our neighbors, our, their families and friends. And to this we say, Amen. Amen. And I would uh, invite then uh, President Emeritus Cottrell to introduce Mayor Nirenberg. Thank you, President Mingler. It's wonderful to have you here tonight with us and have all of you with us as well. Community Conversations addresses what the toxic world we live in is not. It addresses a belief in reason. It addresses a belief in civility. It addresses a belief in deep listening. It addresses a belief in faith. And it addresses, as President Mengler said, the seeking of the common good. All of this is in a conversational setting that is, we can listen to, we can question, we can agree with, and sometimes disagree with, and do so civilly. That's how community conversation came to be. It came out of the purposes, and it came out of the charism of St. Mary's University, founded by the Mary's. Let me introduce very briefly our folks here tonight. Mayor Nuremberg's full biography you can find in your program. However, you know that he was here a year and a half ago on the question of elections, although he was a council member then, serving from 2013 to 2017. He was elected mayor overwhelmingly 
in June 2017. And he hit the ground running. He began immediately working on articulating and implementing his vision. You see that he went to Trinity University, graduated from University of Pennsylvania, and maybe an experience that really helped him in what he's now doing. He directed the Center for Public Policy in the Annenberg School. The Annenberg School, for those who may not have heard of it, is really famed in the United States for its public policy analysis and its communication capabilities. And he set in motion civic engagement activities in a number of cities in the United States, winning awards for that, but also gaining the experience which he brings to San Antonio. Finally, I think tonight we're going to hear a holistic, wholesome view of the city. We're going to hear about infrastructure. We're going to hear about equity. We're going to hear about inequality. We're going to hear about environmental quality. We're going to hear about faith and trust in civic engagement because he has a vision that includes all of these things and more. So I ask you uh, to join me in giving a welcome to our mayor again, Mayor Ron Nirenberg, and now I'm going to introduce in a moment, our moderator, Mayor Nirenberg. I know our moderator well. He graduated St. Mary's University in uh, turbulent times. He was a real leader when he was here, uh, actually following his journalistic career early. He was the Rattler editor. I mentioned to uh, President Menger that these were times of uh, Vietnam civil rights protests, the rise of the Chicano and Mexicano movement here on campus and in the region. And he covered it all. It was exciting days to read the Rattler during uh, to see how many were peace and how many were hot articles and so on during those days. He uh, had his, has a distinguished career as a journalist. And if you read, uh, you see that he has done freelance work, publishing in New York Times, the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun. He's worked with the National Catholic Reporter. He's worked with two major days, one in Houston, one in San Antonio. And most recently, Rick was the host for Texas Week with Rick Casey, the PBS program. He did that until September. Rick is, uh, never stops, he's very busy. He and his wife uh, live here in San Antonio, and he's writing uh, a book that basically looks at the transitions of San Antonio from a town to a major city. Join me in welcoming our moderator, Rick Casey. Thank you. 
Vietnam War, whether it was one of the stories we did on the civil rights movement. I suspect that it was the story written by the late sports columnist suggesting that had we played Trinity University up here in basketball, Trinity would have won. It's a very similar story. Um, I was editor of the Trinitonian about 20 years ago, and the only time we had all of our issues stolen off the racks was when we had an unflattering article about one of the fraternities. <laughs> a little different. <laughs> um, let's, I, I want to just talk a lot about policy tonight, because I think one of the things that's really interesting to get across, remember, as a young person, not really understanding what the city did, I think that'll be... Something you want to about. I want to start with a little bit of a political dynamic. When you were, up until a few months ago, when you were uh, became mayor, uh, you were city councilman, and it, it seemed like a regular occurrence when you were voting either by yourself or with only one or two other people. And as a matter of fact, it, there was an attempt to make it a campaign against uh, the issue against you that you were an outlier, that you didn't play well with others and that you couldn't be a leader if you couldn't get people to vote for you. Uh, the most, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but when, in one case you chaired the committee developing our first city master plan, very important thing to develop. Uh, it was a long process yeah, in, in decades, and uh, there were some changes made, and you voted to restore it. And I don't think you had a second on that one. Did you? Maybe. Maybe you had a second. It's all part of the past. <laughs> But now you're mayor, and I don't even recall a book. You, you've done some things that have been controversial. Your, your predecessor, the first thing she did was come move was to close down a you know, project for the, for the streetcar downtown. You very quickly took down the uh, Confederate monument uh, in Travis Park. But I can't think of an issue where you've had more than two people on the other side. So it's kind of real quick. I wonder if I can get you to talk about it. Was that a political thing? Was it one thing where I can imagine a dynamic where people see you want to be mayor, and some of them think they can be mayor too? What, what do you think was going on? Well, I think there's a lot of things, and I can talk about some of them. Um, first, I don't know necessarily that a lot of the votes that I took as a council member, even in the final days of me being a councilman, uh, were me against the world. I mean, there were some high-profile votes for sure. Uh, one in particular, uh, where I was a, the lone vote, several where I had two or three members of, of council with me. Uh, but the vast majority of what local governments do, and this is part of, the, part of the issue with civic engagement, the vast majority of what local governments do is pretty, you know, unexciting. You know, it, it's infrastructure, it's services, it's park maintenance, it's libraries. And that doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but it does require council to be a uh, suit and do his homework and, and vote. Uh, for the most part, council function on those issues. But the high profile ones, uh, I was often alone or with a minority. I can remember in particular uh, a vote to improve via bus service on the south and west sides of town that um, you know, I think it was a 7 4 vote. I was in the minority. With which, which would require money from city Yeah, city. allocating city funds, which would have had, I can explain this in more detail, but it would have had zero fiscal impact on the city budget, but it was going to augment the via, via uh, service. Votes like that, high profile, some controversial. Uh, I was often in the minority, especially towards the end. I think there was some political gamesmanship. It's very hard to uh, go against an incumbent mayor. Um, you know, and, and you know, it was a different council. I think this a uh, couple of things. One, you know, we've talked about the fact that I, I thought, you know, I, we can talk about my motivations for running for office for mayor. I didn't view myself as having a choice because I think that this city is going places. We have an opportunity to capture the potential of building uh, a city that's equitable, that's uh, forward looking, that is progressive on a number of issues. We weren't doing that. And the difference was we had. We weren't articulating a vision or setting an agenda to, to move us forward. So I ran for office on the agenda. I happen to believe that you've seen great change in the council in terms of the issues that we're working on, the vision that's being articulated, the agenda that we're carrying forward, because um, that's who we put together. That's who the voters chose to move our 
city for. And so I find myself on a council having run for mayor, having one seat, because what we were talking about during the campaign was what the city of San Antonio wanted, what we needed. Uh, the fact that I uh, am now sitting in the center seat is a reflection of the change that's occurred throughout the council. But there were two in particular, am I correct, that uh, there was District 7 where Anna Sandoval, who was very progressive, uh, one of an incumbent who had been kind of frankly wishy-washy on, on issues, and another where Joe Pryor, former head of the Chamber of Commerce, conservative person District 9, was beaten by a fellow who's run as a Democrat in a number of elections, not encouraged. So that, that, that's two out of ten. That's pretty significant. Yes, uh, but if you look at where, where the change occurred, I, I've known for a long time as a former member or a former resident of the District 9, the politics at council doesn't always reflect the populace. Mm -hmm. And that, that district has changed. The demographic has changed. It's a great reflection of the city of San Antonio. And, and when you have a, a representative of the district that speaks to the issues that those residents care about, you get you, you get the kind of councilman that I think that you're seeing out of John Courage, uh, who's taking stands that I think are, are people are in the rest of San Antonio are not used to seeing a district nine council member talk about public education, libraries. Um, environmental concerns, growth management. Um, same thing is true with District 7, which is one of the swing districts in San Antonio. Councilman uh, Sandoval is very forward. She's a public health expert. She's uh, you know, a, a climate scientist. She's bringing a very forceful vision about the environment to council. Those are things that change the dynamic almost overnight, especially when you have, in my case, uh, from the mayor's seat, someone who's setting an agenda on all of those things, on equity, on environment. There may be a significant number of people in the audience who are not familiar with her. She just had such an extraordinary resume to be playing out. She was a classmate of the Castro twins at Jefferson High School. Uh, she went from there, got a scholarship to Harvard, I mean to MIT to study electrical engineering. Uh, did a uh, Fulbright fellowship in Mexico City, studied international business, came back worked for a while and decided to get a degree in uh, environmental engineering. She thought Stanford would be a good place for that and, and did it. And having picked up that master's, thought, you know, there is a public health component to this. And so went to Harvard to get a master's in public health. And then came back and started doing politics on other things. <laughs> so, yeah, you've got some good people to work with. Yeah, and you look at the senior member of the council, which happened to be all in the left side of the diet's physical left yeah. uh, when it comes to inner city uh, urban communities, District 1, District 2, District 3, uh, you know, Councilman Shaw um, from District 2 is representing a, a very nuanced and progressive and economic development focused mission for the east side, which, you know, frankly has been begging for that kind of leadership for a long time. And, and so I'm, I'm very excited. And I guess the change in the dynamic is, is a reflection of the, uh, of the vision that has been articulated through this last election. But they, but the, the council, I believe, still has a majority who have advanced degrees, including you, which is you know, not something that's a long-standing tradition in San Antonio. Uh, we're also younger. <laughs> and now you're paid, which is a good thing. Um, okay, I'd like to focus on a couple of issues in which you were in the minority as a councilman, and now you have the responsibility for dealing with them. You were very much in uh, a very isolated minority, raising questions about Mr. Rich. You make me sound very lonely, Rich. <laughs> I don't feel sorry for you. He is married to one of the most wonderful women in the, in the city. So I'm not worried about you being lonely. Um, she is the uh, president elect, is still elect, or is she president yet? We'll be in February. The right? Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and she's really a. Uh, I teased him after his, uh, his uh, kickoff rally that he had made a really bad mistake. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I wouldn't let 
anybody have me follow your wife? <laughs> See, uh, so you were you were a skeptic on Mr. Ridge. I'm not sure if you ever took any votes against it, but you were raising some uncomfortable issues. Now that you're mayor and as mayor, a voting member of the SAWS board, um, what do you see? What are those issues, or are they remaining, and what are you doing to address them? So, you know, you, you said I'm a skeptic. Um, I would say I'm a skeptical. Uh, I've always been a critic, and I think we have to be a critic on a project like that. Um, you know, there, there are people in our community um, I'm not one of them who just say philosophically we cannot move water from one basin to another in the state of Texas, and that's the way the law used to work. Um, there's some uncomfortable realities we have to grapple with worldwide, not just in Texas. I think we need to do a basic explanation of what the Vista Ridge is. Okay. Um, so Vista Ridge, the project, is a uh, pipeline that's going to be placed in between uh, San Antonio and the community in Burleson County, which is in that area north, northeast uh, of Austin, uh, sparsely populated, more rural area, uh, abundant in water resources. San Antonio has you no know, home. It's about 140 miles away. Um, the project is a 30 year agreement with a renewal period of 30 years in which we are, will be receiving uh, 50,000 acre feet of water annually beginning in 2020 when the contract period begins. Um, so there are a number of complicating factors. One, or there's a number of realities we have to, we have to uh, discuss. One is, for the first time in humankind, um, the world is living in urban areas more than rural ones, meaning that the whole globe has a challenge of making sure that there are water resources in places where people are, which isn't necessarily where water is. So what you're seeing in, across the world is people are trying to figure it out through technology, through moving water, through you know catchment systems and so forth. Um, the same is true in, in Texas, even more so, where we're seeing urbanization of Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, El Paso. We have water resources here in San Antonio that we've been blessed with in the Edwards Aquifer. We've been using that water for 400 years. Um, in order for us to be good stewards of that water, we have to not pump too much of it because it will affect ecosystems downstream. It's a very elegant solution. We know, however, that our population is going to double in the next 35 years. One thing we can't get wrong is underestimating the need for water. So as we look out at our population and we look and we project our needs for water, we know that if we just maintain our level of pumping from Edwards, in being responsible stewards of that water, and we use the available water that we have in the rest of the portfolio, we're going to run out of water based on the projections. Now, we can conserve better, and that's something I have demanded as a part of our process of dealing with the water issue. And we're going to continue to get good at it, and we're going to get even better at it, and that should be calculated in our projections. But we can't underestimate the fact that we're going to need more water. We need the best available alternative. Um, Vista Ridge, in addition to the other resources, are that alternative. I am a critic, uh, and I have had to play the role of skeptic when the questions aren't being raised. Thankfully, now I'm on the board of SAWS as, as mayor, and I will be able to, and I have even today, you know, asked many of those questions. My concerns, without getting too wonky for folks, because it's it's a very complicated topic. It's, it's important to understand that city politics uh, have a lot of wonk too. Yes, absolutely. So, in order for us to actually pull the water, um, we have to have an agreement in place that allows us to purchase the water. We have those in place, and we're contracting through a, a third party to do that. Um, in order to actually transport the water here, we need to have transport permits from the state of, from that groundwater district to do so. My, a lot of my criticism of this project has been we need to have certainty in those permits. Um, they have not been able to prove that up. Part of it is a legislative issue because the state doesn't, uh, has not uh, allowed us to extend those permits unilaterally. Uh, we have to work politically, uh, so to speak, with the groundwater districts to give us permission to do so. Um, so my question for SAWS has been, make sure that if we're planning our water supply, our water portfolio for the next 30 to 60 years, 
and we're going to put our eggs into the Vista Ridge basket, then we can actually guarantee our rate payers that we're going to have that water. Because the risk that we, we run uh, of not investing in a water portfolio is that we end up purchasing water or planning to purchase water that never arrives here when we should have been investing in something else. What I've told the saw is it's expensive water. Make sure that we're, before we ask ratepayers to support that water, that we're showing that we've been best in class in conservation. We've done that. Make sure that we're asking. Well, let me ask you, uh, the, one of the issues raised by some environmental folks here is the nature of the economics of a, of a water company, which is what SAWS is, is that they, they make money on selling us water. Now, SAWS has actually been a leader in conservation. We've done better than most other cities. That's not to say that we can't do even better. But once that water, we, we have to start paying for it, and it's the most expensive source of water that we have, isn't there a conflict within SAWS and the economics of SAWS between pushing us to use less water while we have to pay for that? Yes, there is. And that, again, for the wonky folks that like to watch these sessions in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon on TV, <laughs> this was one of the shining moments of debate on council when uh, Councilman Pryor, then District 9 Councilman Pryor, and I debated the mission of SAWS. SAWS, as it was putting together this project, um, I became a skeptic because I kept hearing the words, SAWS is in the business of selling water. It's not. SAWS is in the business of providing water to San Antonio residents and the San Antonio water system community. The difference is, and it, it's nuanced, but the difference is if our business was just to sell water, we'd be buying up as much as we could and selling it as the highest dollar possible. We are a municipally owned water utility. We have a public to serve. We have many low income public to serve. Our mission is to make sure that we have adequate water supplies for the future. Therein lies the problem. We run the risk of underestimating if we're too judicious with our projections. So what I try to do is make sure that we have a strong conservation program and that we are evaluating and being skeptical about these regional water projects to the best of our ability so we don't end up having too much water. We will end up with too much water, no matter what we do, because we want to always over-project just enough so that we, end up, we don't end up with a water choice. And that's the situation we find ourselves with Vista Ridge, is a take and pay project. We have rights to have water 50,000 acre feet, they're gonna send us all of it and we have to pay for all of it. We know we're gonna have excess in the near term years. But in 2050 and 2060 and 2070, when we actually need that water, that we're gonna be waiting for you know, Superman if we haven't done our planning. Um, I wish we had a phased in approach. Um, you know, it, water, unfortunately, because the state of Texas, and I will say this uh, to the cows come home, the state of Texas has not done its job to manage our water. Uh, if we do not have a safe water plan, one that, get, that, that manages groundwater the same way we manage surface water, um, in light of that, local communities have to look out for their own. If I was king for a day, I would have the state put together a water plan that says that it, managing groundwater isn't just about the square feet of land that you have, because if I have a square foot of land and you have a square foot of land, I had a longer straw and you had a shorter straw, that means I can take all the water out of that aquifer even though we're sitting right next to each other. That doesn't make any sense, but that's the way state water law works today. There's a lot of water to cover. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go on days. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was on a water panel entirely about water yesterday as William was in. It was, it was a good panel. Um, but let's talk about an, another area that is fraught with politics. Water in Texas is always fraught with politics. But, and, and that is, I'm talking about a million more people coming. We have to plan for growth. Almost everybody agrees with that. Um, the, I think, frankly, my feeling is that one of the tragedies of the last 50 years of San Antonio has been the power of the developers and suburban developers. There were, until recently, very few downtown or inner city developers. Uh, 
And it was so powerful, I'll give you an example that involves a gentleman who's sitting right next to Charlie Control there, Alex Persenio, when he was city manager, uh, argued that in new subdivisions, we should require that the sidewalks be four feet wide. And, and I was there, and I've always remembered this, Alex. And he made a family value argument for that. He said, have you ever tried walking with your wife hand in hand on a three-foot sidewalk? <laughs> and then you add one, you've got mailbox cuts into the sidewalk. And it was just, it, it's pretty obvious. He got creamed on city council. Because the developer got said, well, we won't be able to build affordable housing anymore, which is frankly hogwash. <laughs> but uh, if somebody who knows that economics at home doesn't explain to me, it's not that simple. It's not dollar for dollar. But where you were pretty close to a loan you know, on when the master plan came through, which had some carrots and some sticks for dealing with issues like smart growth and being, having sustainable growth uh, and the, trying to work on sprawl and something called impervious cover, which if any of you follow any of the coverage of the Houston floods, you understand the more concrete and roofs we put down, the more water um, it's not going to be earth it goes downhill. Uh, after you spent what well, almost two years working with people around the community to build the plan, it take a few months. It'll take a few months. Uh, after your committee voted it out, it went to the planning commission, which is heavily the majority of the people representing the development interest. And they, they kept in the carrots, but they took out the sticks. And then when it went to city council, you made a motion to put the sticks back in. You, you made a motion to return it to what it was two weeks earlier. When the public had been deliberating about it for 18 Exactly. Years. And the response, one after another, of your colleagues, the mayor, and several others said, well, Ron brought us this last minute change. And yeah, we're just not prepared to deal with it. If that wasn't the last minute change, what the planning commission did was the last minute change. But that's what went through. Not the true mayor. And it's one of the things you talk about at the water conference. You and Suzanne Scott of the Centennial River Foot were talking about how, just in terms of water control, we need to be much more careful about how we develop, or else we're going to have more expenses than we can deal with. How politically can you get that done and how do you do it in the face of the power that you've seen over the last 15 years? Well, I mean, I think that, so there, there are no enemies in this conversation. I mean, really, when you when you talk to the average home builder, developer, suburban or otherwise, they're just trying to make money. Sure. And so part of the challenge that we have, we have to recognize is the fact that because the market has not figured out how to make money, we have now a deficit of affordable homes of about 140,000 in our homes uh, in, in our city. We have to figure out a way that generates the kind of home building that is sustainable, the kind that you know Alex would have liked to have seen. Um, and so that's what we're focused on. How do we create a mix of carrots and sticks that allows the market to find uh, benefit in the things that we want to see? Um, but as far as uh, how we approach this conversation, you know, with the planning commission defanging what, what I call defanging of the SA tomorrow plan, we have to recognize the will of the people. There was an outcry about this. I was comfortable being alone on the vote because I know I was now alone out in my neighborhood. Um, as a result of all this, the council rightly has called for an examination of how we actually appoint people to the planning commission. And I can tell you today, my staff reported to me that where we usually get about 15 or 20 applications to planning commission when there's a vacancy, we got 58. Wow. 58 people from varying walks of life knowing that we want to reshape and kind of make the public better represented on the planning commission have applied to be on the planning commission, which helps us determine the development codes that you see houses being built on. Um, I think we push forward and we do so knowing that we're not trying to create any enemies, we're trying to make a market recognized that the will of the people has changed. We're trying to make it so that private developers can also make money building sustainable communities. 
Um, those that recognize that, the businesses that are, are more forward-looking, will find that to be a benefit to them. Uh, but as far as me, as a policymaker, as a leader of, uh, of the public, we don't have a choice. Uh, forget the politics and forget necessarily that the, the public is calling for this. We see what happens if we don't do it. Um, we know that you know, climate change or otherwise, our extreme weather events are occurring. We are a flood-prone area to begin with. We have lower-income residents who are increasingly living in more flood-prone areas. If we don't take care of what is causing increased flood water, i.e. extraordinary amounts of impervious cover and overbuilding in certain parts of our city, then we will be suffering the consequences and all of us will have to pay for it. And that's not an option. Let's, let's shift to transit. Uh, that was a very popular decision by uh, Mayor Ivy Taylor to, uh, <laughs> to kill the, uh, the streetcar. Uh, and we did have one vote on that on light rail. It's been almost 20 years. It was uh, 2001, 2000, somewhere in there. Uh, and it was pretty heavy against. Uh, you're very much in favor of it. How do you lay the groundwork? And because we passed a charter amendment requiring that the citizens get to vote on any city about receiving money going to uh, any, any kind of rail mass transit. Which, which I don't, I'm not concerned about. In fact, that was one of the reasons why streetcar failed. I was not in favor of streetcar um, because it was really, um, it was not addressing the transportation concerns that are clearly out in the community. Um, and when you don't do that, you run a valve of the public will on something as important as transportation. Oh, it's not. So I, I kind of have to go, in a way, rail has become almost theological. You're either for it or against it. And the reality is that it's really wonderful where it makes sense. Yeah. And it's really expensive and a waste of money where it doesn't. And I was worried that people thought, well, they're going to love the streetcar and that'll make them want other things. Yeah. I was afraid it'd be a total fiasco. Well, it's even harder. You know, a lot of people are, are saying to me, uh, and, and I think it's a small group of folks that say, we already voted for this. When we, we voted down streetcar, we didn't vote on streetcar. But what we did was we recognized there was an extreme amount of pushback because the plan wasn't ready for prime time. Number one, it had a number of different potholes leading up to actually being discussed. And then it was simply a, a um, east-west corridor that was going to be on the existing street right of way for downtown. That is not addressing the real transit concerns that are in the vast majority of residential communities in San Antonio. I'm finding that it's not a theological issue. It's actually, well, it might be, but most people are agnostic. <laughs> um, when I talk, and I, I'm pro transportation, pro transit. When I talk to people out in the community about streetcar in the north side, they hate it. But they also hate it sitting in traffic. Um, when I talk to folks, and I've been talking about transportation and transit solutions for, for five years uh, as, a, as an elected official, we recognize the fact that the last time we actually had a vote on this was pre-9-11. You remember what the world looked like then. Gas was under a dollar a gallon. 1604 was a speedway. Um, you had to wait at the light to get from 410 to 281. Um, the world was much different. If we do exactly what we're doing now, as bad as traffic has gotten in some areas, those bottlenecks that get us all angry, they're going to be at 900% in terms of wait times. Average traffic transit times are going to be up 75%. We're adding 150 vehicles to area roads every single day. Doing nothing is not an option. What people want is a transportation solution that actually speeds up their transit or helps them make sure that we're keeping a damper of congestion. We're doing groundwork now. We have a corridor study that is part of the SA tomorrow plan that has identified where um, the major density is occurring. We don't have just one downtown in San Antonio. We have 13 of them. Brook City Base, Port San Antonio, UTSA in the Medical Center area, um, Rolling Oaks, Downtown Central Business District, um, the Forum. These are all areas where people are living. There's a lot of jobs, and there's a lot of economic and retail activity happening. Therefore, 
by the studies that we've done. We know where people's points A and points B are. That's the map that we need to be working with. We don't need to guess where trains and routes need to go. We just simply need to connect areas of density where people are traveling from and traveling to. That's the, that's the genesis of where we're going with this. Um, and hopefully, uh, within the next few years, we'll have some options to look at them about. I will suggest to you that there's no way any politician should dare in any community that's been living on one mode of transportation for so long to put something in front and start building without asking the public where they are. There's no better way to do that than on a ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, are we we're getting close to time we do I want to we're not close. How, how much time <laughs>
nationally on this to figure out ways that we can reduce or hold the property tax burden on legacy homeowners in, in older areas of town. Um, you know, the challenge really uh, that I, I keep hearing though, at least in terms of building the built environment, is that we continue to sprawl outward and those areas that are sprawled aren't connected to the services that, that you know, we're trying to build in the urban community, which is one of the reasons why housing affordability and equity in the city rely so heavily on fixing our transportation system, ensuring that if you are uh, working a, a service job uh, in northwest San Antonio, you can either get to and from work in a reasonable and cost-effective way, um, or you have affordable homes that you can live in closer to where you work. What we're finding now is that the, the exact opposite is true. Um, you see higher income communities with, with service jobs that are so disconnected from areas where the people who work there can, can live. I want to talk about, uh, it, and you've got the impression a whole lot of what he does is this wonkish cousin goals. City goals. I can talk to you about it. Yeah, it, yeah it, it, it comes across. <laughs> but I want to talk about a hot button issue because that's that's part of urban politics too. And uh, you, you waded into that with the removal of the memorial, uh, the Confederate memorial uh, in Travis Park. Uh, and I mean, there was a letter to the editor today about it. I mean, it's just played on and on. Almost as many letters to editor as, as there are about top of it. <laughs> uh, that was one monument. Right. There's a bunch more. I suspect that your perception on that whole issue, obviously you had already had quite a strong sense about where you were on the issue, but you just got back from a visit to Germany. I'd like you to just talk about that and how that relates. What, what you did in Germany and how that relates to... Uh, well, you know, one of the first things, actually the first resolution I signed uh, as mayor was this, the, the charter of compassion, that we would build our city and do all of our policies, policy making on this fundamental principle of being compassionate about it. Um, so I had a two-pronged mission uh, that has economic development return for the city of San Antonio and job creation opportunities for the city of San Antonio, uh, a two-pronged mission to Israel and to Germany. Uh, my last day in Israel, we spent at Yad Vashem, which if anyone knows uh, is, or doesn't know, it's the uh, world's memorial to the Holocaust, to survivors and victims of the Holocaust. Um, we got on a flight that day, and, and the first thing I did um, with the Lord Mayor of Darmstadt, Germany, which is our new sister city we just signed um, a couple weeks ago, was I stood on the corner and watched the ceremony of laying up the Stolperstein, which is a gold block about that big that they lay. It's just called a stumbling stone in the pavement to recognize where people were taken um, from their homes. Um, people who didn't have the right skin color or who, you know, were Jews or simply didn't um, sympathize with, with the, the um, you know, the, the rise of the Fuhrer. Um, that was moving, number one, because, you know, I, I come from my father's side, a Jewish family who has origins in that area. Um, but it was a great example of how one city in the middle of Germany becomes progressive and reconciles with its very sordid past. I, I guess where I, you know, what I hear about that, and when the young, some young Germans came to San Antonio and expressed their surprise, if you take a look at the Holocaust, which was a moral, just uh, an unconscionable thing. If you look at chattel slavery, how far away is that from the Holocaust? I mean, as a moral evil, that people get to own people, kill them if they want, rape them if they want, 
uh, you know, it's, it's not a, a huge step. And yet over there, you run into a monument uh, that would be the equivalent if we had monuments here that basically got across the message that we, we, need, to, we need to deal with the fact that this is what we had and it was a part of our founding DNA. And it's a process, and it's a it's a, a reconciliation process for Germany, the laying of these stones. And again, it's a it's a recognition of one thing: the Holocaust didn't happen in some ancient time. This was modern industrialized Europe, and it happened because there were enough people uh, throughout Europe who simply didn't want to look, didn't ask questions, just just didn't want to have to deal with that. Um, as you know, in some cases, neighbors were being sent to ghettos and then sent to be exterminated. Um, this tells me it can happen anywhere, and in fact, it does. You can go look on the world news section of CNN. You can see genocide happening every single day across the world. What it what it does for me as a local official, obviously, personally moving, but um, it says that we do have to deal with issues that come to us. You know, the, the Confederacy and the racial tension in America um, won't go away if we simply just refuse to deal with it or just don't put it on the agenda. What I wanted to do is respect the process, make sure that we had a public process, which we did, um, and ensure that we did so in a very um, safe way. Um, you saw what was happening in the rest of the country. My goal was when this, I knew where my colleagues were. On this issue, I knew where I was. There's a very big difference between having monuments in museums that, in which we can learn from and having monuments anonymously in the middle of parks where we will glorify the causes of a war. Big difference. I wanted to make sure that we didn't remove this monument, but we placed it, in, we placed it so we can learn from it. Uh, and I knew where my colleagues were. They wanted this to happen. They put a CCR in front of me in front of the, the council. CCR. Uh, a, a consideration request, a request for legislation, a request for, for resolution. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we did this in a way that kept the peace, knowing that the, the, the fury was really rising if we did not deal with this. Um, so we did. We had public hearings. We have been having public hearings for two years. We had public hearings the week and for prior, for several weeks prior to the vote, but I wanted to make sure that when we had the vote and it was decided we got the statue moved um, without anyone getting hurt or getting killed. Mm -hmm. I understand it's hard to explain uh, for some folks, but I can tell you that we respected a public process, we dealt with a very difficult issue, and nobody got hurt in San Antonio. I'm very proud of that. Was it your concern? Was it your concern that if you uh, had it more in public and took longer, that it would give people from the other parts of the country, as we saw happening in Charlottesville, time to come in and Yes, say, I wanted San Antonio to deal with this San Antonio issue. Uh, and, and we had already had threats from um, you know, council members. Um, we all were receiving threats. Um, and, and it became very clear that San Antonio was next to be on the, you know, the center of attention. I wanted to make sure that San Antonians had an opportunity to, 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 to deal with this issue together locally, and, and that's what we did. Uh, we're in the middle of a serious change in one, one area, one not exactly war that we were stating it, but in the last legislative session, we faced uh, a number of issues in which uh, the state was taking power away from cities, and a number of issues where they wanted to. Uh, one area where it was a sanctuary city, they basically passed a law telling our police chief that if, if you don't deal with the immigration issue the way we want you to, you're going to go to jail. Um, that's and, not and city managers and council members. Yeah, and council members, members and possibly even members of the library board if they speak out <laughs> and say the wrong thing. Under this law, it could be interpreted that they could. Uh, so, uh, there were a number of other ones, though, that didn't happen. Some of that may have been because of Joe Strauss as Speaker of the House. Joe is not going to be Speaker of the House next time. 
how do you see this playing out? I you had a lot of things in your play that doesn't have a whole lot of time to think of it, but uh, how do you see it playing out? What we see is the Republican legislators, some of them are admitting, admitting that we got to control the cities because they're run by Democrats. Dan Patrick, for example, said things along that line. So I, I've spent uh, a considerable amount of time with mayors in Texas and, and other mayors as well. And if they're anything like I understand them and the way I've described is they're all listening to the will of the people too. The vast majority of Texas now lives in cities, or actually the majority of Texas lives in cities. Um, we are following the will of the people and dealing with issues that are very serious with regard to education, transportation, health, um, and we're doing so sometimes because the state is not. Um, the way I see this playing out is I expect, uh, a, again, a very polarized legislature without the, the moderating force of someone like Joe Strauss. And I have to say, every time I say his name, thank God for Joe Strauss. Amen. Uh, I hope he's not done with public service. Um, I see this getting through fairly polarized, but where I see this going is that the polarization and the increased um, I should say uh, denigration of urban communities, where this is leading is a acceleration of the change that many legislators are trying to prevent in Texas. How, how does that work? Because clearly um, the state as a whole it's still very much Republican, and, uh, and it's been pushed because of the nature of, of the primaries have been, yeah. the, the Republican primary, like Dan Patrick, the governor is worried that Dan Patrick might take him on, so he's done but a special session with a number it's of not, It's not Democrat or Republican, uh, in my mind. This is not about red or blue. Um, what I see this is more of an urban-rural issue. Republicans and Democrats agree on issues of environment. They agree on issues of education. They agree on issues of overdevelopment and being prepared for storms that we're seeing increasing on the coast. Those are the issues I'm concerned about locally. Uh, with regard to local authority, we see the legislature and forget, you know, uh, you know, forget the hot button issues. We saw authority being stripped on managing our tree canopies on annexing property so that we can protect military installations. We saw um, you know, many opportunities to fix our public education system go by the boards once again. Um, those are the issues that are polarizing Texas. And, and as legislators continue to, to throw the gauntlet at cities, I think the people of cities are going to start throwing the gauntlet at those legislators. Well, you, you may be right, but in, in, the Demo in the Republican primary, cities have an advantage in a sense in that they're not elected by parties, at least in most of the South, including here. Uh, I think we've seen a political dynamic, though, where the business community in San Antonio recognized, beginning with Henry Cisneros, and ever since, that the mayor that works best for them is a progressive who's also pro-business but who on social issues is likely to be pretty, pretty progressive. That's not, what you, that's not what wins Republican primaries these days. And right now, the legislature is basically, in both houses now, are more than two-thirds, or about two-thirds Republican. So there's a, a different organism, always has been. That's why so few mayors go into higher office. Uh, yeah. Because you're not, you're not, you don't do what, you, you don't have to do what you would need to do to get elected in in some of these primaries. Yeah, I, but but I but what I, what I would say is that you're you're going to see a more hopefully not probably in this legislative session or, or the next, but you're going to see a more city focused, more progressive mindset even from the right side of the aisle. I hope you may be right. I, I, it did occur to me that uh, it's obvious that the, that the Democrats can't turn Texas purple, but maybe Dan Patrick and Bound can. <laughs> I think that's exactly what you're saying. Regardless of the color, um, the issues of urban communities are only going to become more critical for the survival of the state. Um, you know, let's not forget that this, the state relies on the taxes we send it that are generated here by jobs in San Antonio and Austin and Houston and Dallas. 
We have to thrive as a community. We have to be able to educate our citizens as a community. We have to be able to prevent you know, flooding as a community if the state is going to thrive. And when they begin to recognize that, and I think many of them do on both sides of the aisle, um, I think we'll be better off as, as, as this legislature, um, and particularly in the Senate, continue to get more polarized. I think you're going to see that reality come to the foreground much quicker. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that's really fascinating to me is how, in the national politics, uh, President Trump got elected by painting this, the nation as dystopian and cities as totally dystopian. But the reality is, if you go to cities around the country, most of them are like San Antonio. They are progressing, and the people seem to be pretty happy with their local officials. Uh, you, you replace an incumbent, but it wasn't like there was a total revolution. We recently voted to quit paying our council members twenty dollars a week, which wouldn't have happened. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, you got a three thousand dollar bonus. You're in good shape. I know I'm going to have to choose between milk and wife uh, and flowers for my wife. <laughs>
Yeah. It's all about capturing wealth. Capturing wealth. All, all about different part, part of the issue for me is that the, the legislature over the last 30 years has made that model um, upside down in terms of the economies of scale for cities. We, we are having to subsidize the state on infrastructure that they should be paying for. Um, I'll give you a great example. I think it was about to the tune of about $30 million that we had to, to um, subsidize for the state to build the overpasses at 281 and 1604. Had we not allocated that money from local funds, from our bond program, we wouldn't have built those. They wouldn't have contributed to build those. That's a state road. Um, we see what's happening at the local school districts in terms of the responsibilities. Um, there are many areas where we are simply uh, doing the work of the state because the economies of scale have just gone upside down. I do believe that annexation is a good tool if we get to if, if it allows us to control our destiny. I'm a, a strong believer in managed growth. Um, so when it comes to things like bases, military bases, areas of the city where we simply don't want to see a lot of development occur, we have the authority as a city to zone to produce development codes that slow down or, or you know, encourage development in one place and discourage it in others. A good place to do that is the over the Edwards Aquifer. If we had the gumption to annex in undeveloped areas so that we can control the destiny of those areas, either around bases or over sensitive areas, we should do it. Simply grabbing house rooftops because of the tax revenue is a model that I think is out of the 1960s. Um, it doesn't work anymore. Okay, one last thing for the questions. Uh, here's a, a, an issue in a tax bill you probably weren't thinking about when you were running for mayor. You probably thought it was kind of going along smoothly. But we are about to have a 300th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that the people who thought was doing it, they're gone. And probably with good cause. Uh, and it's not nearly as far along as we hoped and thought about it was. And so you've had to kind of step into it. Uh, How is that going? And also, if you could get across a sense of what what do we want to do? What do we want to do with that landmark? Do we just want to do it for a big party, yeah. or what, what do we want to do? Well, I'll tell you first, it's going it's going well. Um, to the credit of the folks that are working in the commission, a lot of the stuff is is a is a cake that isn't fully baked yet. We're going to be doing tricentennial work throughout the year, and a number of that of those funds and everything that is required are not going to be there right at the start. That being said, there were some fundraising challenges that we, I'm sure you've all read about. Uh, we've had a number of corporations either give, uh, I can let you know that USAA has made a major gift, HEB has made a major gift, New Star, Bill Greeky has made a major gift. Um, we hope to be announcing some major gifts pretty soon. So I'm confident we're going to do this right. But part of the challenge of the tricentennial is that I don't think people knew what it was or what it meant. I will describe to you what the tricentennial is. It's not a party. We have a New Year's Eve party. It's going to be great. We have Fiesta, which is a party that can't be topped. Uh, but tricentennial is an opportunity, our moment in time for us in a lifetime to really tell people about our city. I'll describe it this way. About a month ago, I had a woman. Um, in my office, we were talking, she's a friend. She was describing how she grew up in Donna, Texas in the 60s. Anyone know where Donna, Texas is? No. Um, small town, Valley, Texas. It's small now, imagine in the mid 60s. Every weekend her mother would take her and her siblings to the post office to pick up a copy of the San Antonio Express News. And they'd read about it, about this metropolis, this futuristic city that was about to celebrate the World's Fair. Um, so in 1968, her mother put all the kids in the van, came up to San Antonio, got them out and said, in the hemisphere, go experience the world, taste the world, experience San Antonio, this futuristic city. She aspired from that point to move here, to raise her family here, to build a business here, and she did. Uh, and she was describing the story to me, and that's, you know, that's the story I've told ad nauseum now, because that's what the tricentennial is. This is our opportunity for us on a world stage to talk about and to celebrate and to let people know about our history, our story.
but also the city that we're going to become, the city of the future, the things that we're working on in transportation and education and housing and all these other things. There's going to be infrastructure. There's going to be artwork. There's going to be some parties. There's going to be a celebration of military and our international community and many of the things that make up San Antonio. But the tricentennial is our moment in time to let people know why they should aspire to invest here, to move here, to visit here, to stay here, to grow a family here. That, to me, is what the tricentennial is. And that's why, when I talk to people in the business community or even individuals, we don't have any options. I don't have the luxury of pointing fingers and saying, what happened? We, as a community, as a city that believes in itself, our only option is to make this thing great. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Are we going to carry the mics to people? Or <coughs> uh, these gentlemen are going to take the mics to anybody who would like to raise their hand to ask a question. And uh, I'm sure we all are just absolutely wonderful people who would never do this, but on some occasions in these kind of forums, people want to make a long speech. And that's why these guys are going to hold on to the mic. So we've got Lady Good evening, welcome. See what I see? See what I mean? She's trying to grab it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it working? There you go. Good evening, and welcome to St. Mary's. Is a former student here at St. Uh, one year at St. Mary's before returning to my true alma mater, whose mother is Anatorium Dei Gloriam. I was also a copy editor of the Rattler and enjoyed my experiences there. My question is, you didn't um, talk about your real issues of you know, towards the end, especially education and uh, level of income, etc. How come it is that, uh, I believe the latest statistics on the literacy rate here in San Antonio is three out of five. What are we doing about um, getting that? I've been I'm 25 years ago when I came back to San Antonio. Um, that was the same rate. I know the influx of new immigrants coming into the city keeps that rate high. But I think we should have been able to think of a, of a way to be very uh, proactive in solving that problem. And the other question I have, which is very more or less a rhetorical one, is why can we not limit um, or prohibit people from coming and selling here in San Antonio area? They can come and visit. You know, you know there's a state that here in the U.S. has done that. has been very um, successful. They can come and visit, spend their money, but they see. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, we have to do a better job at literacy, both in child youth literacy, but also in adult literacy. We have an extraordinary problem. Um, I will say the city of San Antonio uh, addresses that challenge through a number of different measures. We are actively involved in, in literacy organizations. Uh, our own employees and, and our own families do it. Um, we are, literacy, I will be clear, was one of the primary motivations for us involved in getting involved in the pre-K for SA program. We we're going to see the first cohort go through the third grade to see if the third grade reading level, which we sold this program on, is really being shored up by pre-K programs. We have to look for additional ways to address the issue of literacy, and part of that is working with the legislature, getting students ready for early childhood education, getting students ready for kindergarten, and watching, uh, aiding through all means necessary, their progression through literacy is a vital, um, of vital importance for, for the city. I'm with you. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Mayor. I want to know how uh, important is it for you for science? Because as a early childhood uh, educator, Yes. Well, 
we know through our, our workforce studies that STEM is critical. Um, science, technology, engineering, math, we used to cordon those off for different industries and, and science-related jobs, but STEM careers, well, STEM education is in every job. Uh, it teaches critical thinking skills, it teaches uh, us to be problem solvers, and so we are actively involved in STEM education programs in the public public education system. We just declared the STEM week that is part of the, the Chamber's activity. Um, next year, we'll be piloting a uh, program, uh, a Mayor's STEM Challenge, that is hopefully going to unite the different public school districts with their STEM programs to really help gin up the, the attention and focus being given to STEM education. Um, as with the other aims around education and literacy, we do need to be working collaboratively with our legislature to do things like make algebra to a requirement. Um, there are a lot of things that we need to do as a local community, but also as a state and a nation, uh, to do better on STEM. Well, how about early childhood education? Start there. Um, STEM is a part of the pre K for SA curriculum. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, uh, and as far as universal pre K, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, but but <laughs> yeah, that's what we're trying to do with pre K for SA is become a model program that shows and demonstrates best practices for um, pre K. Are you ready? Are you ready to bid on that? Uh, I think I'm loud enough without a microphone. Uh, I'm a freshman here at St. Mary. I'm majoring in political science and English. And one of my political science courses this semester is sustainable human development. So when you talked about sustainability with um, housing development, I was wondering what are your other initiatives or stances for sustainability as um, San Antonio is developing and growing. So how are we going to do that in a sustainable manner to where we're not negatively impacting our environment? Yeah, well, you know, what... Would you repeat that to the folks from that? Oh, sure. What, what are the other uh, ways that we are addressing the issue of sustainability in addition to just housing, housing development? Um, the other first thing that we did as a council was pass a resolution declaring that we would be fully vested in the Paris Agreements. Um, climate uh, issues, climate preparedness, and also sustainability as a general issue is fundamental to how we're building the SA tomorrow plan. So that will impact the way we handle our energy grid, for one. We're pushing resiliency and we're, we're, we have done more than I think most any uh, municipal, municipally owned power company has done to introduce low carbon sources of energy. Uh, in doing so, we're cleaning up our air. We've got, you know, we unfortunately are going to be declared non-attainment very soon. Uh, but we have, we are doing uh, work on early action for cleaning up the air and ensuring we have a sustainable air quality. Uh, with regard to our water supply, we did talk about that, but ensuring that we have a sustainable water supply is what drives our balance between uh, producing, you know, regional water sources and conservation and so forth. So I would say that sustainability is a general value and resiliency are fundamental to everything that we're doing in the city. Sure that particularly on the west side, but all across San Antonio, we're not leaving our children behind. Uh, 
um, as you know, we see increasing disparities in educational outcomes. Did I summarize that? Right. Um, what I would say to that, knowing that the city has indirect um, control, indirect impact on the school districts themselves, is that we're building our budgets and we're building our system of governance on equity. Um, particularly focusing on how we shore up communities to provide services and infrastructure uh, and to build communities where people who have lived in cycles of generational poverty have opportunities to go beyond that. Um, I'll also say it's one of the critical reasons why we um, augmented the via transit budget in the south and west sides of town. Um, we know that where people have less choice, but more necessity from their public transportation system, that is oftentimes the means by which they get home or get to, get to work or get you know, their children to school. So by augmenting something simple like uh, public transportation and ensuring that you know, parents can have the opportunity to get on a bus every 30 minutes as opposed to having to wait an hour or two hours for transfer, that's time home early to do homework with kids. It's oh, actually, one of, the, uh, one of the reasons why the program is so essential is because on the west side, a lot of the parents are actually illiterate. So when children get home, they don't have access to help with their homework. So that's why they call it to these uh, local tutoring centers where they can go after school and actually have help with their homework because once they reach home, there's no help there. So, and, and illustrating the point then, that it is the nuts and bolts of city operations that either contribute to or detract from equity in our communities that contributes to or detracts from generational poverty. I'm proud to say that this council is focused in on that issue. Um, you've seen it You've seen it now in multiple areas, but most clearly in the fiscal year 18 budget where we decided to use an equity lens um, to manage budget on transportation where we decided to improve the bus service on those particular times, particular parts of town, including the west side that don't, uh, are not, not equitable service. Um, it's also the reason why we now have a chief equity officer of the city of San Antonio to look at all of the different operations of our city through a lens of how we, we break through these cycles of, of inequity. Hello, I just thank you for taking your time to come uh, at the St. Mary's community, what are some things that we aren't doing right now that you'd like our students and the rest of our community to be doing in the tricentennial year and the years to be followed? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I hate to, I, I love you guys. <laughs> I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your classmates. They're not voting. They're not voting in nearly enough numbers to make a difference in the community that we're trying to build. And it makes it very difficult for local government leaders to have a forward-looking agenda. Um, thankfully, we have a, a courageous council, I would say, that is able to look beyond the two-year election cycle and look to how we're having an impact on a 20 or 30-year time frame. But until we have people who are going to be impacted by that agenda, voting in greater numbers, it's going to be very difficult. And we learn, we, we risk losing that kind of courage from one election cycle to the next. Um, so that's what I would ask. Uh, with regard to Tricentennial, go on SA300.com or .org and uh, get involved in the programs. We need everyone in our community to be talking about the fact that this is our 300th year. There are things happening in our community that they should be part of, that they should celebrate. Um, and, you know, if you want to volunteer, that's great. But I think the most important gift that you could give the city on its tricentennial is to become an active voter. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and Alitas, is this working? No, it's not taking speak up. Ladies and Alitas, uh, government graduate 1968 from St. Mary's and 74 from Rock Hall. And uh, this area historically on Spanish maps was known as El Despoblado which means uninhabited. That was because it was either flood or drought. So my first point is whether or not the city is requiring or has a plan for development.
developers for more diversion dams to recharge. The second point is that concerning transportation, it's not a sin to have one-way streets <laughs> and overpasses. And the third point is that this country was founded on honoring our dead, and there are a number of souls that are under Santa Rosa Hospital and Miley Park. Is the city aware that a lot of those bodies are still there, and do they have a plan for reinterment? That's it. Yeah, thank you for your question. I, and I will have to admit I'm not up to speed on all the details of your last point, but my understanding is that the Office of Historic Preservation and um, the uh, representatives, representatives of the indigenous community have been working together for a memorial uh, that actually honors the dead as we find them. We're, we're being very careful, uh, considering that this is the history and legacy and heritage of San Antonio to make sure that we're not just simply building uh, on top of very sacred sites. I have to divert this for a second. When I was in Darmstadt, they also showed me uh, the rubble of, of their only Orthodox uh, temple, synagogue. In the early 2000s, the city was getting ready to expand their hospital. And the mayor at the time, or so, getting ready to expand their hospital. And they got some, you know, older resident gentleman said, you can't do that. That, that might be, I think I see a block there or something. That, that might be the site of the old synagogue. And you don't want to, you don't want to pave over that because that's a very important site. Well, they kept going and going as, as bureaucracies tend to do. The mayor at the time said, stop. And from that moment, they started an archaeological dig that has now turned into an extraordinary um, museum in honor of their Jewish community that is now starting to rebuild around that site. Everybody you know, ended up happy because they were able to expand elsewhere for the hospital. Point being, um, local governments, especially in hearing from residents that, that have history, that, that know what they're talking about, um, are responsive and certainly, at least in this council, in, this, in, in City Hall 2017, you have people like that. Um, I forgot your first question. That was about uh, diversion dams. Oh, yes. I don't know any specific plans for diversion dams, but the city of San Antonio policy today is not to allow any development in the 100-year floodplain and not any development in the 100-year floodplain fringe. What we're finding, especially in light of Sarah data, San Antonio River Authority data, as it relates to Hurricane Harvey, um, that might not be enough. We have to do a better job in building in terms of impervious cover that produces uh, runoff, but we also have to examine, perhaps, uh, building of structures in 500-year floodplain. I'm not saying that that's where we're going, but it needs to be examined. Uh, we know we have 11,000 plus structures in the 100-year floodplain that were built prior to those regulations that we have now, uh, and we have done um, we have done a lot of work with the public over the last 20 years to divert flood water, and also to uh, remove structures in some cases from that floodplain. I, I would mention that the San Antonio River Authority has built, I think, I want to say 17 diversion dams. Uh, that's, that's really their specialty area of uh, controlling water. Two more questions. Two more questions. Here we go. Uh, Mayor Herber, first, thanks for being here uh, again. We appreciate it. Um, as someone who self-identifies as progressive, as someone who self-identifies as liberal, I look at my federal and state governments and let's just say I don't feel represented. Uh, so on that point, it's nice to hear someone at least at the local level who is making sense to me. I appreciate that. My book, Progress, is not a bad word. <laughs> I don't know how it became one, but um, my question is, you already spoke at length about the fact that these state and federal powers are trying to strip power away from you, basically, power away from your office, from local offices, you seemed optimistic in that conversation. I was wondering if you could share with us your cause for optimism. And then as a second part to the question, what could someone like me do besides vote to kind of help metaphorically fight back? Um, great question. Um, so I'm an optimist. <laughs> uh, I, you know, ex expect the best, prepare for the worst, that's kind of how I live my life. Um, 
you know, I have a great faith in people, and having worked in civic engagement in 22 different cities from coast to coast since 2000, um, people want that. In many cases, people aren't aware of how they can be part of the solution. Uh, that's why voting is such an easy answer. Um, so what I would say in addition to voting is learn how to organize. Uh -huh. But not just learn how to organize, learn how to help yourself and your, and your friends and family and neighbors get informed. Not everything you read on Facebook is factual. Not everything you hear from your friends is curated. Um, everyone here ought to subscribe to a newspaper. I mean, it, it, the fact of the matter is, we do have to rely on an increasingly connected, on-demand and on-time, always-on world. We have to rely on people to curate news for us when we're increasingly distracted by everything else. Um, so that's what I would say. Help, you know, learn yourself how to get informed on issues that, you know, especially those ones that get you uh, riled up. Uh, and help your uh, friends and neighbors do that as well, and then learn how to organize. Hi, my name is Maria Mancha. I'm a political science major here at St. Mary's. So my question was, San Antonio currently is a sanctuary city. So with the SB4 law that has passed, how, do you can, how would you keep San Antonio a sanctuary city if at all keeping it a sanctuary city? Well, so I'll disagree with your premise there for a second, because no one who's really upset um, on either side of this issue of sanctuary cities has bothered to give us a definition. What I, what I would say to that is that our city and our law enforcement is not in the business of, of enforcing immigration. Um, we are a welcoming community. We're a city of immigrants, and we will treat everyone fairly, and we won't profile based on the color of someone's skin or otherwise. Um, when it comes to detainer requests from ICE that are legitimate, we honor those. That's our obligation to do so. Um, but in terms of, you know, enforcing immigration law and stopping people on, on a whim because they may appear to be an, an undocumented immigrant, we, we won't do that. We all have a well-documented crime issue that we are handling and, and making inroads on. We need all the manpower, resources, and funds that we have to, to, to execute on that mission going towards that, not on doing the job of federal immigration. And that's what our police chief and police chiefs around the country are telling us. And I'd much rather listen to law enforcement professionals on the issue of law enforcement than politicians in Austin or D.C. We had questions and didn't get them asked, but we also uh, promised ourselves, promised the mayor, and promised Rick Casey that we would conclude at 8 or go after. <coughs> President Mengler opened uh, with a comment and a prayer on the Sugarland Springs and the tragedy that occurred there. You know that at 8.30 this evening at the Bell Tower there will be a vigil, a vigil for those uh, victims and for their families and for the losses and tragedy that, that they've experienced. That's 8.30 this evening at the Bell Tower. We have had this evening, uh, we've, we've worn the mayor and Rick Casey out, I think. We've talked, we've talked a long time. Say, go ahead, have my Red Bull before. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I think we've gotten a mini, a mini seminar at Urban Politics tonight, and uh, I only wish that we had been uh, and the uh, courses surrounding this, this particular event. It's been a wonderful evening, and uh, we deeply appreciate your being here, taking the time to be with us, and the conversational tone, and uh, Rick Casey's humor, and, and your uh, enduring patience and the questions and so on. We want to thank you, and um, you have a lot of supporters in the room for the vision, your vision for San Antonio. 
We are on your